Hey there, class of 2023. My name is Mr. Reem. And a lot of you, this might be our first time digitally meeting. Uh, we may have met around the halls or in the classes at, at various times last year when you were in ninth grade. Um, but this is a, a, a new year for you and a new year for all of us. We're all kind of taking this one step at a time. But I do want to introduce myself both to you as a student, if you're watching this, and you as the parents, because um, up until this point, you have been working with Ms. Dolberg, Lisa Dolberg, who's been our eighth and ninth grade counselor. And this is the first year that you'll actually be jumping on to my caseload. So my name is Jeff, uh, Mr. Reem for your students. And I'll be taking over as your school counselor and you'll be on my caseload for the remainder of high school. And so I'll be working with you each year as we develop the three main domains of school counseling. So the academic, the social emotional, and then the college and career piece. And we'll build on each of those different subjects as we go through the upcoming years. Naturally, this is going to be an interesting year and a little bit kind of outside the norm. And so we're going to kind of attempt to address a few key things that a lot of times plague 10th grade students, um, and it might be exacerbated by the current circumstances. And so we'll take a few minutes today just to go over that. And I'm hoping to get you done in about 45 minutes. And I, I really highly value taking you, you taking the time to watch this because number one is it lets me get to know you a little bit. You get to put a name to a face. Um, but I get to share a few pieces of information with you uh, that will help us set the stage for this 10th grade year, which really is kind of a foundational year as we go into kind of higher level learning in, in high school. So I want to have you sit back. Feel free to pause the video at any point. This is going to be hosted on YouTube. If you have any questions, I'll be covering how to reach out and how to make appointments and stuff like that in just a second. But I want to just welcome you and say hi um, and, and just really let you put a, a name to a face. But I'll be switching over here to the presentation itself and walking us through the different pieces of content that I have for you today. So for our presentation today, the main focus is actually going to be on staying the path. And there's a lot of differences, like I mentioned, this year than in years in the past. Uh, this is not a normal year, just like last spring was not a normal spring. And so I do want to just make sure that you know that, that, that we are fully aware that this is going to be a challenge that's probably going to last for more than just six to eight months. There's going to be lasting ramifications from the quarantine, from the difference in how school worked and, and you know, that's going to be something that we will have to be addressing for quite a while. And so we're working on plans to do that. And I'm going to be here to walk along the side with you um, as students and as parents and families. And so feel free to, to lean on me for information to, to provide advice or information that you might like um, on any, anything. And so you can reach out and I'll show you on our website in just a second how to find a few pieces of information. But my email is typically the fastest way to get a response. Um, my voicemail and phone sometimes is, is not as prompt just because I'm in and out of meetings and in and out of the office. And so emails I'm able to answer in between. So be sure to jot down my email address and it's right there on the screen. So, so that's just an important component that you should just be highly aware of is I'm pretty prompt on my email responses. So if you have anything coming up, just let us know. Today, uh, on this video, I want to kind of walk through a, a few pieces of information that will be important for 10th graders. All right. Um, we're going to take a little bit of time and talk about some common problems that 10th graders tend to face. Um, it's a very unique year. We'll talk a little about kind of how to prepare ourselves for some of the options that come up after high school, which really does matter now as a 10th grader. Um, we will dive into some thoughts about testing and, and it's going to be, again, everything is going to be more unique this year, and it's going to be even even more special with testing. And so uh, pay attention when we get there, because while it's not going to likely have a large impact this current calendar year, uh, there will probably be lasting reverberations into future years, which will impact the class of 2023. All right, we'll talk about college and career options and kind of a few ways to to work on developing our plans there. And we'll also spend a little bit of time in this in this agenda talking just about how 10th graders work and how do how do what does their brain look like and how do things function as a student who's maybe 14 or 15, 16 years old even and you know just what's going on in their brain and how sometimes it's fighting against them, sometimes it really helps them and sometimes it's really fighting against what they want to do. And so sometimes it's nice as a parent or a guardian to really understand a little bit more of the 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 bio, you know, the the bi, you know, the, the neurobiology of of what's happening. So we'll take just a few minutes and go through kind of like um, a little bit about the brain. So 
Before we kind of dive into the content, I just want to give you a few logistical items. Like I said, um, our school website is very versatile. We have a lot of information up there. I, I highly encourage you to check it out. It provides a lot of details about our school in itself. But selfishly, I think our school counseling website is the best website we have. And so I want to make sure you know how to find that. And so while there's not a main link on one of these menu items, you do have to kind of go to the programs tab, which you see on the, on the screen here. And then underneath the school counseling menu down here at the bottom. All right, so you'll click on that and that will open up a brand new website that looks kind of just like this. And the, the content and the pictures and some of the links and buttons tend to change over the year. Um, we, we I try to keep it fresh with the most information that's gonna be relevant for the time frame of that given year. So what you'll see up here is gonna be, you know, there'll be different pictures and different buttons, you know, depending if it's the fall, winter, or spring. But a lot of stuff that stays relatively the same is up here at the top. And so you can click on a bunch of this, you know, there's a lot of rich content in here. If you want to take a few minutes and explore some of them, I would encourage that. But again, I mentioned the contact us. So, so the about us has the contact page. You'll also note there's two areas, number one, and it's not showing here, but on the website, you'll see a little chat box. Feel free to utilize that. Um, those are great for some quick questions uh, that you might have, and it's open to anybody. And so it just gives you an option if we're available and generally we are pretty available in most kind of school hours. So if you want to leave a chat and have a quick chat question, feel free to use that here. And then also this is where you're going to be making all of our online appointments. And it's the same system that Ms. Dolberg has used. Um, you'll just make sure to pick 10th. It'll, it'll give you either grade 9 or grade 10, 11, and 12. It'll make sure that you're scheduled with me instead of Ms. Dolberg since you're on my caseload now. So I want to let Hillary, I think this is going to work, let Hillary give you a second to talk about um, her and what she's got going on. Maybe not. So this is Hillary. Um, in our other video that didn't look like it translated onto this video here, um, I'll make sure to link it. But uh, Hillary Stoner, uh, actually Hil Hillary Jimenez now, she is our wellness center coordinator and she is an awesome individual, an awesome person and an awesome member. She is a full-fledged partner in our counseling program. And so she provides a lot of uh, tier one level supports for students and is a very trusted confidant of students. And so I definitely want to make sure that you know who she is. Um, and then if you get a chance, um, look down in the description and I'll make sure that I, I post a, a link to her little short introductory video talking about the wellness center and, you know, a little bit about her. And so feel free to take a second and watch that. But a couple tips, just as we kind of continue this journey through high school, I want to make sure that you know, um, What's the best and most effective way to use your school counselor? Me. Uh, and so we do, like I mentioned before, use appointments, and that's a pretty important thing. So if you email me asking me for an appointment, I'm going to probably just email you back with a link that says, please click here to book your appointment. It's a live calendar link, so it'll actually show you, if you click on it, it'll show you when we are or are not available. So pick the soonest time that you feel like is going to be appropriate for you or your family, um, and just make sure that it's something that you can make. The other piece is I always encourage uh, being cognizant of what classes you might be, if you're going to be booking it during school hours, what classes you might be getting pulled out of. Make sure it's not a class where you're struggling. Um, and I do check those things. And sometimes I will cancel it if I see that you're getting an F in math and you booked an appointment during math. Um, you know, I'll ask you to book it at another time because I, I want to make sure and honor the time and the, the courses that you might be struggling in. Uh, we, we don't use our Facebook page nearly as much as we do because Ms. Mitchell does a great job with our school Facebook page. So we kind of just, you know, hop on the, the bandwagon with her. But like I said, feel free to reach out if you have anything that comes up. Um, I would happily answer a million questions versus having a question not answered and then having it impact a student or, or a family in some way. And so feel free. There's no dumb questions. Most of you haven't done this before. And I don't know the answers to everything. Um, I'm pretty knowledgeable, I'm pretty informed, and I'm pretty connected, but um, I definitely don't have all the answers. And so sometimes I might just let you know, like, hey, I have to redo a little research. I got to contact someone about that. Give me a couple of days and I'll get back to you on it. Okay. So I do welcome all and any questions. I always like to just highlight a few norms for parents and students. So depending on who's watching this, if you're a parent, um, the first part is going to really kind of identify what that looks like. But some of the things that you're gonna be looking at as a parent is really about, and this is a, a key year in 10th grade, a lot of ninth grade, eighth grade, parents are a little bit more involved when we see parents hit high school age, it kind of becomes a little bit more hands off, which in a sense is good, um, but in some sense it's also bad. So I wanna find that happy medium, and I think you'll hear me say balance quite a bit today. And so one of the biggest things that I can encourage you to do as a parent is to be that cheerleader. 
all right, to be the coach, okay, you are not the one to be taking on their responsibility. Meaning if I'm hearing from you more than I'm hearing from the student about an issue or about a, you know, a request or things like that, that's slightly a problem. All right, so I want to hear from the students. The students need to be the ones starting to step into this world of taking their own responsibility for things. And we do push students to do that. And sometimes I will push back. Um, I'll, I'll ask a parent, you know, if I get an email from them, I'll say, please have your student contact me. I want to talk with them. Or I'll just include them on the email reply. Okay, so just be aware that that's, that's something that we are looking forward to. And I'll talk about why that's important in just a second. But um, just be aware. You do also want to start the conversation about life after high school, and that could be anything. I think sometimes we get a, a not a bad reputation, but a reputation that we push college. And while we do value the world of college and we think college is a great option for quite a few students, it is by no means the only option. The, the problem where we kind of get stuck and why I think that feels that way sometimes is because the world of this college, you know, kind of, and when I say college, like four-year college, is because there's so many requirements that have to be met in order to, to have the even option to apply. And so one of the things that we really value and work hard towards is making sure that every student has any option that they want available after high school. And sometimes that means helping students maintain that college level track um, until they really have an opportunity to either demonstrate or decide that that's not what they wanna do. All right. So we do want to make sure, you know, as parents that you're paying attention. Again, it's this balancing act. You don't want to over nag, but you don't want to just let them be free range either. You want to kind of have that happy medium where you're keeping track and maybe you're having a few conversations, but not necessarily taking that responsibility away from the student. Students, for you guys, um, it's important to start thinking about the world after high school now. Okay, and it's not about what do I want to do when I grow up, it's what do I enjoy? What do I like to be involved in? What are the things that spark my interest? All right, and then as we kind of develop some of those interests and, and passion is a tough word to, to describe something in, that a high schooler feels. Um, it's very rarely that, but it's maybe the spark of a passion. And so keeping an eye out for that and just paying attention to how you spend your free time. What do you like to do? What are your interests? The things that you're naturally gravitated towards, okay? You do want to also start keeping a calendar and developing that organizational skill. That's going to be a valuable thing both in high school and after high school, no matter what your career path looks like. Uh, we do have deadlines, and we'll talk about a few of them in this presentation. So make sure that maybe you're writing them down, maybe adding them to that calendar. And then starting to and continuing to, to, to kind of create relationships and positive relationships with teachers. As students get older, those relationships are very valuable. Uh, on this distance learning that we're in currently and even in a hybrid Attending office hours is a very valuable opportunity to develop, to not only get support academically, but also just connect with a teacher on a one on one personal basis. Um, those teachers are going to be a high level of support for your student, whether it's academic, social, emotional or college and career. And so spend time developing relationships with teachers and myself. Um, we are all likely going to potentially be asked to maybe write you guys a letter of recommendation. It's much easier and more fulfilling to do so if we have a relationship with you um, as a student. And so that's something that we are looking forward to. It's very valuable for us as, as professionals too, to, to have those kind of, um, you know, teacher parent or teacher student relationships where we can uh, learn about each other and, and support each other along the way. So it does take a little bit of effort on the students part to, to make themselves themselves open and available to that. And sometimes stepping out of that comfort zone. All right. So I want to kind of go over a little bit of the neurobiology in five minutes. All right. And so we have super complicated brains. It's amazing at what they do. Um, However, a lot of times in this age range, kind of this adolescent age, there's a lot of things that can get in the way of our brain working to, to kind of like full level, all right? And so it doesn't always feel like teenager brains are all the way there, and they're not, and that's the truth. And so this is kind of a, a pretty good description of what I think it feels like uh, for you know, many people in the teenager brain. So we have like the love lobe, we have rebellion, and then somewhere little down here, this little spot memory for chores and homework and stuff like that. Um, and little communication skills and balance and coordination levels. Like there's a lot of things, but that are taking over kind of the focus of the brain. But it's not always what we as adults think it should be. And it's not always what we as adults can remember having struggles with as well. All right. So 
ultimately, we have three key pieces of our brain. All right, the neocortex, which is the gray matter, um, that is built of a bunch of neurons that, that connect together and really let us do some higher level thinking. All right, that's what often separates us from a lot of different species. And so that gray matter really lets us uh, create good thought. And we'll come back to that in a second. Um, the limbic system is talking about the emotions. All right. And so uh, it talks about how we handle things, the amygdala, the hippocampus, a lot of those things are in there. And so those two things uh, regulate a lot of our different emotions. And those two areas are particularly um, elevated during adolescence and during this time frame of being a sophomore and kind of a 15, 16 year old student. And so it's not uncommon. This is why we see so many moody, quote unquote, moody teenagers and moody um, and a lot of like risk taking behaviors and things like that. So the, the moodiness is sometimes caused because of these release of these neurochemicals that um, get in the way of you know, the, the regulation that we need to, to manage our emotions and our behaviors. And so that in combination, so the reptilian brain is just kind of like, that's that basic dinosaur like brain where it regulates our emotion and our breathing, not our emotion, but our breathing and our heart rate and stuff like that. It's, it's our non thinking brain. It's, it's the automatic system. Um, so the main two areas that impact us are the, the limbic and the neocortex. The key part of the neocortex, uh, kind of on the last picture here where we saw this love lobe, that's actually called the prefrontal cortex. And what that does is that provides that, that kind of like executive functioning, the I can think three or four steps down the road, the planning ahead, the consequence. That is a key piece of that part of the brain. And the, the sad, cruel part of a teenage brain is that is the, one of the last parts to actually develop. And so it's, it's, I think scientists have said that it's about 24, 25 years of age when that, that part of the brain becomes, you know, essentially fully developed and everyone's develops at different rates and different time frames. So you, you see some students earlier, some students later, but in general, um, 24, 25 is when that brain is fully developed to what it's going to develop to. Um, the, the reason why that's matters for our, our 15, 16 year old kids and even into, you know, early twenties is it's why we see a lot of this risk taking behavior. It's why we see a lot of, I'm going to sit on TikTok or Snapchat instead of doing my homework, because that is what it is not only fulfilling the emotional requirement that our amygdala and hippocampus are, are asking and, and demanding. It is also, um, you know, it's like the perfect storm allowing our prefrontal cortex to not think about the consequences of not doing our homework and studying for that exam or not driving 90 miles an hour without a seatbelt on. Like those things are going to be um, impacts that we will see. And some of them are smaller and some of them can be larger consequences. And so it is important to, to keep that in mind as parents that while, again, we want this balancing act, we do have to kind of step in. We have a fully developed prefrontal cortex. And so while we can think three steps ahead, these kids can't. Um, in every circumstance. And so sometimes we have to make some decisions on behalf of them. Um, and other times we have to let them learn. And that's, that's again, that balancing act is I want students to have the natural consequences when it's something that they can recover from. However, when things are, are going to have consequences that might have lasting impacts for a lifetime or a long period of time, that's where you as parents really should probably step in and, and have some conversations and some real deep, uh, kind of interaction with your kids about what that means and, and making some decisions on their behalf. It's not, you know, being a parent is tough. I don't have a teenager yet. I have a four-year-old and a three-month-old. And so while every stage is different, I do have hundreds of students that I've worked with. And so it is important that you know as parents that, yes, it's great to be their, their friend. It's great to be the person that they want to hang out with. Um, and I hope that you are. That's a great relationship tool and a great way to, to interact with your kids. They also need you to be the parent and, and make the decisions that a parent would make. And so that's a fine line. And, and I don't want to inform you of how to do that, but it is important to know that you likely will need to do that. Okay. And so just figuring out what that looks like for you as a family um, to make some of those important decisions. So this kind of talks a little bit and shows you a little bit about uh, what that kind of process of that development looks like. And there's actually something in your brain called myelin. And it's kind of like this fatty sheath that almost like if you think of an extension cord, it's an insulated inst extension cord. It helps the, the neurons that are firing to be more efficient. 
All right, and so as you see this on the screen from age five to age 20, this use of its different, the different areas of the brain are gonna be increasing. The purple and pink is, is really where most of the brain activity is working in these different brain images. And so it is something that, you know, you will see growth over time. And so maybe in high school, you're starting somewhere in between here. And by the end, you're starting, you know, you're kind of in between here. Um, in the next slide, I'll talk about some of the impacts of making decisions in this realm. But, um, you know, the, the brain is primed for learning right now. Okay. And so it is actually like probably in one of its peak, apart from like being an infant, probably one of the peak time frames for its actual learning. The problem is with our brains as a teenager, we also can't categorize things. That organization that you might notice your student having trouble with is a big issue with the brain, all right, as a teenager. And so it's something that you have to kind of maybe help scaffold, meaning you have to kind of help provide some of the, the structures um, for them to, to work within and then let them build from there. So you don't necessarily want them to give them a free form architecture project. You want to build in the outlines and let them work within some constraints to kind of develop those pathways in that brain to help them get better at it. All right. Because that purple that also shows that that myelin sheath, that insulation lets those neurons fire faster. Okay. And that's something that's also currently being developed as a teenager. All right. So kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what's going on maybe in your teenager's brain. Um, there's a lot of other crazy things going on in your teenager brain too, but um, that's the, the nitty gritty of it. Uh, there's a lot of good books out there that I can recommend if you want to read about it or have some, you know, have a Ted talk or something like that. But that's kind of a, a little bit of background about what's happening in your kid's head. Um, and, and some of the things that we see as a result of some of that is sophomores often will, will think that they're old enough to make a lot of their own decisions. All right. And so they want to be treated kind of like an adult. However, a lot of times they don't gather the same information and make good decisions because of their brain and that, that prefrontal cortex and the emotional kind of like surge of chemicals that's happening in their brain all the time. Um, a lot of times they want to have the responsibility to make a decision, but then make really poor decisions because they don't, they don't have the capability of gathering the information. And so again, it's fine line piece. Um, they oftentimes will prioritize like the social aspect over their schooling. Um, again, goes back to their brain and kind of how we are as a human being. Uh, it's just an important thing just to be aware of. And that can have an impact on academics if they're, you know, just chatting with their friends instead of studying or learning. Um, typically the 10th grade, um, they call it the sophomore summer, the summer after sophomore years when kind of the light bulb clicks on for a lot of kids. And some, most of the time it's good. Um, that light bulb clicking on is oftentimes a very good thing because they can actually connect what they're doing to high school at, to the life after high school. And so a lot of times kids will become a little bit more serious about school um, towards the middle or end of their sophomore year. Um, another couple of problems are that they oftentimes rely on their parents or others to take care of their responsibilities. They'll, they'll kind of defer or push off their responsibility on someone else. So those are things that we t often see, all right? Another thing that we often see as a, as a sophomore is sometimes they've already gotten themselves into some, you know, holes or pitfalls. And the good news is it's often not too late at this point. There's a lot of opportunities if, if say, for example, they wanted to be A through G eligible, and we'll talk about that as well. But that's like being prepared for college, for your college. There's a lot of circumstances where that could potentially not be too late if they got an F or a D or something like that in a class. You know, if they've gotten a, a smattering of Fs and Ds, that's a little bit larger of an issue. But a lot of times there's still ways to reach any goal that they would like at this point. All right. But it is something that we have to kind of set as a priority and it will, their, their results will re reflect on whether or not they work hard. You know, their results at school are directly related to their effort and energy that they'll put in, All right? The students who will work hard and people will work at different rates. All right. So because someone took 30 minutes to do a homework assignment in math, another student might take an hour to do that homework and that's okay. I don't want you to compare student to student. That that's not mean a student is smarter or not smart. Just means they might have an easier subject than, than another. And maybe that same student flip flops in English and the, the student took an hour in math, takes a half hour in English. Okay. Um, our biggest thing is we don't want to shut any doors. Like I said earlier, we want to encourage every door to be open. A lot of students think certain things in 10th grade. And by the time they're a senior, they change their mind 10 times between now and then. Okay. So we want to keep all options open at this point. 
And we will encourage families to do so for as long as possible because we think that is probably the best route to take. All right, so we wanna keep those options open for as long as physically possible. Um, so in just a second, I'm gonna talk about our, our kind of graduation and, and, and college requirements. Like I said, because we, we value students having options open. So I wanna make sure you as students and you as, as parents understand what some of those requirements are gonna be. Um, they are very closely knit together, and that's a good thing for almost every student. Okay, so a lot of our graduation requirements are essentially the same as college requirements. And so there's a few finer details, but um, if you're meeting graduation requirements within a, a, a clear, uh, like a, a close sphere of kind of like connection, they're, they're pretty close to being our A through G requirements as well. I underline and bold this because it is very important. And this is a 10th grade year, so it becomes more important as we start looking and planning for junior year and senior year. But balance and fit are hyper important. I can't stress that enough. Um, especially students, so so there, it, it's important for all students, but I think it's extra important if you have a student who's pretty driven, who is a student that really wants to achieve, who wants to go hard. And parents most likely you might struggle with this too, finding balance maybe in your life. And I know I do from time to time, and it's important for us to realize that, again, us as adults mirroring what we would expect ourselves to be able to do um, is causing epidemics outside of the COVID epidemic and pandemic um, among our teens. Stress and overcommitting is, is a super real thing. We're seeing rampant anxiety, depression, you know, suicidal ideation. And there's a lot of reasons because of that. But I do think one of them is because we are expecting students to do so much. Okay, so I really do want to stress for you finding balance and finding the right fit for your individual student, not the student that you think they need to be, not the student that they think necessarily they should, even should be, but this, for where they are at that current time. Okay, and so even if that means that, yes, they may not take every single AP class that's offered at Nortal High School, um, the likelihood is that is not a right fit for many, if any, students. And so we want to make sure that you understand that while we are making things available, by no means do we want every student to do it all. Okay, so making sure we do that. Here's kind of how a typical effort and undertaking looks over the course of high school. So up on, on the on the left side, you see effort undertaking. So the higher the, the line gets, the, the more that they're going to be taking on. In ninth grade, students take a pretty standard set of classes. In 10th grade, it kind of jumps up a little bit, and you, you're going to be working a lot harder. In 11th grade, here's what kind of happens, though. Like I said, it, it, we'll talk about AP classes in a minute, but in 11th grade, a lot of things open up. Students can take more more on. They have a lot more responsibility in a lot of different areas, not even just academics. Okay, so students will tend to take quite a large jump in their kind of requirements in 11th grade, which sometimes is unhealthy. Okay, so you want to find the, the right and appropriate balance for that in junior year. And then a lot of times in senior year, um, they you can kind of pare back a little bit. You don't have to. Um, I would rather see more of a flat line, like a smaller curve, um, taking an appropriate load in both 11th and 12th grade um, versus kind of really ramping it up in junior year and then maybe pulling it back in senior year. Um, I think there's an idea that, oh, I'm a senior, I can only take four classes. And that might be true, but it, it might not be advisable depending on what your goals are. So we'll, that's, a, that's for a whole nother talk. So we'll get there at some point in the future. But um, usually students can pare back a little bit in terms of some of their academics. There's some other er things that do come in. However, this is something just to be aware of a, long, a few years down the road. That sharp precipice is senioritis in the spring of the senior year. That is a super real thing. It causes a lot of issues that uh, are potentially drastic, okay, where students really see kind of the light at the end of the tunnel in that spring time frame of senior year and kind of coast to the end. A lot of times if they're applying to colleges, they might have already gotten in. They might have, you know, there's a lot of things that kind of just have happened already and students will kind of just essentially think that I'm just seeing this out and then I'm going to move on to whatever's left. And that can't necessarily be further from the truth. Okay, so I want you just to be aware. This is kind of what a tip, you know, I won't say typical, but this is not uncommon for what kind of a senior or like a high school process in terms of effort looks like. 
However, I do think we want to kind of avoid that senioritis in the spring and potentially level out that kind of 11th and 12th grade a little bit. I think that's potentially a little unhealthy uh, that we see happening more often. All right. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to walk you through a little bit, just real quickly about A through G requirements. This could be a reminder for some of you guys, uh, but it's just an important thing. We'll likely cover this this year, and we might even cover it at the end of this year into your junior year, um, just because it's so important just to have the information available of what you need to do. All right. So A through G is our CSU and UC, California State University and Univers University of California kind of golden rule. And so... What we see is every letter in that A through G uh, requirements has a subject area. So they are, they are technically called the A through G subject area requirements. And so each of those subject areas is going to have a number of courses. And all these courses have to be approved. And so we go through an approval process with the this, you know, University of California Office of the President every single year. And all of our courses get approved. And so generally, if you're taking courses at North Tower High School or Coldstream or things like that, it's in our district, it's generally not an issue. Um, all of the courses that you're going to need to take are likely A through G approved already. The issue is if you are going to be taking classes outside of school, um, that's something that you need to be aware of. We only approve A through G approved courses. So um, just you know, make sure you communicate if you're taking or planning or thinking about taking courses outside of school. The other piece is we're not going to talk when we don't spend a lot of time talking about NCAA. So NCAA is the National Collegiate Athletics Association, and that is like, you know, NCAA, they have different uh, divisions. So essentially, if you're looking at potentially being recruited as an uh, NCAA Division One or Two athlete, you know, there are some specific requirements. And like I said, in our district, everything is that we need to have approved is, it's really when you look at going outside of our district programming that you have to kind of worry about A through G and NCAA approval. So if you have some questions about that, make sure that we talk about it in advance um, before we do any outside courses. But that's going to be a, for us probably a, a fairly small amount of our students every year. A is history, and you're actually going to need two years of history. With this and a number of other uh, subject areas, you're already going to do this. This is going to be part of your graduation requirements. Here's the difference. For all of these different area requirements, you must earn a C or better. And yes, C minus counts. We're not talking plus or minus here. Those things don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, we're talking standard letter grades. If you receive a D in some of these different subject areas, you are then deficient if you need that area for A through G. With a D, you actually still meet graduation requirements because our Ds do earn credits for us, but not for the A through G requirements. So that is a big denotion that you'll see on every slide. But I just wanna highlight that here. All of these A through G requirements must be passed every term with a C or better, all right? So if you don't earn a C, that might be an opportunity that you might wanna remediate, and we can talk about that individually. So you'll see on here, I'm not gonna read through all the different classes that you see on the screen, but ultimately those are gonna be some different options that you can see. B, just like history, is an English requirement. You need all four years of history. I'm sorry, all four years of English, and you do need to pass all those with a C, bet, C or better. So you'll have to pass, if you get a D in one semester, you're automatically out of the running for A through G requirements. So that would be need, need to be repeated to, to stay on that A through G path to enter a UC or a CSU, which is pretty standard across many colleges. So this that's why we kind of use it as a golden rule. Um, it's pretty standard set of entry level requirements. I do want to go back and just highlight um, for Honors English 9 and Honors English 10. Um, last year and this year are the first formal years that we've changed the title of the course. It's essentially very similar. Um, we were a pilot program for the pre-AP program. And so what you'll see is both classes are technically pre-AP. And so that's the that's one of the big purposes of AP is to kind of encourage more students, the less delineation between the two courses. Um, and so one of them is an honors pre-AP program and one is not. Uh, and so it's just important to know that the, the course names have changed, but the content is fairly similar uh, in terms of kind of what the expectations are and stuff. C is math, so you'll need three years of math, and that's very similar um, to our high school graduation requirement of 30 credits. However, um, a difference is gonna be what you have to capstone at. So in order to meet the A through G requirements, you must have taken geometry during high school. It must appear on your transcript, or integrated math two is the equivalent. Um, they usually use algebra, geometry, and algebra two in their descriptions, but integrated math one, two, and three are essentially the, the loose equivalency of both of those. So you do have to get through math one, two, and three to be eligible. 
However, to graduate high school, you might have taken, say, intro to integrated math, math one, and either and, and math two, or maybe you did math one and two, and then took like a business math class. That would not necessarily meet your requirements for A through G, but you would meet the requirements for graduation. So the math three is an important piece. That green four is highly suggested, especially if you're looking at some sort of STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and math. It's gonna have a heavy math focus, so you're probably gonna to wanna to take a fourth year of math, and that might be pre-calculus, it could be calculus. Um, statistics is sometimes offered, and so we can talk about some of those different uh, options as we get closer to that senior year. So lab science, you'll have two years of a lab science, just like you have here. This is very similar to English and history. Um, you'll have bio and chemistry, most likely as a ninth and 10th grader. As long as you're getting C's or better, congratulations, you're meeting the A through G requirements in that subject area. Um, the three and four, again, is, is it's an opportunity for students to take more advanced kind of college prep level courses. And so while it doesn't have to be a lab science and really conversation is more about, okay, if you didn't do a third year lab science, what might you substitute in this place? Um, there, a lot of times these become electives that students will do and they are technically electives, even though they're gonna fall here in this lab science. Um, like for example, AP biology is a elective in all technical terms. So there's a lot of different options and they do vary year to year. Um, some students may not be able to take their ideal science class when they want to, just be aware of that. Um, different classes are offered at different times, whether it's a scheduling or space issue. We cannot guarantee you a certain class or certain science class at a certain time frame. So you might have to flip some plans around and we'll work with you in scheduling about that in the future. But two years minimum, and as long as you pass your physical and bio, your, your like your chemistry and bio class, you're meeting the minimum expectations and then it becomes being competitive in that area. LOAT or world language. Lang LOAT stands for language other than English. World language is kind of how we really classify it now. So you need two years of a world language. And this is what's different than our, our high school graduation. High school graduation, you need a world language or an art class. So one year of either. For A through G, you need both in different quantities. So for world language, you need two years of the same language. Okay, so it cannot be... French one and Spanish one. That is not two years. That will not meet this requirement. You would need French one and two. You would need Spanish one and two or Spanish three. Um, and so they do recommend a third year or an advanced level um, course in the world language if, if you can. Um, and again, must pass with a C or better. If you come in at like say Spanish three for Spanish speakers, um, maybe you're in the dual immersion program, that technically is a third level class. However, I would highly suggest probably continuing that if at all possible, um, getting to that AP Spanish class and that will be probably your capstone Spanish class and then you'll be done. So technically while you wouldn't have three high school level, like high school year classes, you wouldn't be taking Spanish say in freshman, sophomore and junior year if you started in Spanish three for Spanish speakers. Um, you would technically have five years of a world language by completing AP Spanish. Um, so that's kind of how it works. VPA or visual performing arts, um, you'll need one year of a visual performing arts. So that's where if you took two years of Spanish and then you didn't take an art class, you wouldn't be meeting A through G requirements. And so um, those are gonna be all the classes that you see down there below. And then G, the last category is college prep elective. And this is generally not a hard one for most students to meet. The only issue is gonna be if you're right on the edge, potentially that could be hard, but um, most students don't have any problems because any of these classes that you see on the screen will fill this one year of CPE and you're gonna get that, get half of a year met from economics already uh, that you'll have to have as long as you get a C or better. But also any of those kind of optional classes, an extra science class, uh, extra language class, an extra math class, those things will also fill this requirement. So um, generally don't have to worry too much about this. I wanna take a second and kind of just talk briefly about how some, essentially how college admissions works. Um, a lot of people start thinking about this idea of college uh, as we get into 10th grade and into 11th grade, there's a lot more kind of traction and movement with it. And so I wanna just take a second and, and highlight comprehensive review. And this is for a vast majority of colleges, how students are evaluated when they're applying. And so the best way to describe it is kind of using two pictures. This first one, I would like you, you know, if you were to look, get a picture of this tree, this is tree bark and, and being asked to describe what the tree looks like, it would be easy to describe certain attributes of the tree. You know, it's brown. Um, it looks maybe like it's big or old. 
Uh, but you wouldn't be able to know a lot of different things. You couldn't tell if it was struck by lightning, if it was in a desert or a, a very fertile area. It, it, it wouldn't tell you what color it was, if it was deciduous or not. Like, unless you're a botanist, you probably wouldn't know what type of tree it is by looking at, you know, just the bark itself, this picture. This is a lot of times what most people think college admissions is like. They look at this picture of a kid. And in some systems, they do. CSUs, this is kind of the review that they look like. Okay. Um, they're a little bit more pared back and we'll, we're, we'll get into the nitty gritty of how that works in future years. But just to give you an idea, that's kind of like what uh, most people think it is. When realistically, most schools, the vast majority of schools that are out there look at students like this. So they look at the whole picture. They want to see what a student looks like in a lot of different areas. They widen that lens and take a bigger picture of who's made the student who, what has been their strengths, their challenges, um, what are they bringing to campus with them? Okay, so it really does give you them a better angle to look at how a student would fit on their campus. Okay, so we'll, like I said, we're gonna talk more about like college admissions and stuff like that in future years. Right now, all I want you to worry about is really how do we, how do you as a student develop you to look like this tree? Okay, so it doesn't mean that you have to do certain things. Every student's gonna be a little different. Okay, it's really about it's not just about academics and tests, all right? So we really want students to explore how they can improve themselves in different areas of their lives and how do they pursue things that are valuable to them. You know, a lot. some students might have to work. Some students might have childcare responsibilities. That is part of this comprehensive review. That is valuable information for a college, um, even if it means that they can't play three sports and go to test prep on Saturday. Okay, that's not necessarily the only thing that schools are looking at. So I wanna make sure that you know that as a student and as a family. So talking a little bit about an overview of sophomore year, the biggest thing at the top here is continuing to maintain grades, all right? So this will be the first year um, for our CS, like our local system, which again, we kind of use as that kind of benchmark. Our CSUs and UCs will, will start looking at these grades this term for your class of 2023 starting with this sophomore year for their GPA calculation. They still look at ninth grade. They still see the grades. They still see that if you're, you're, they still use those grades from ninth grade to see if they're meeting A through G requirements. However, when they're calculating GPA, um, they don't use this year. I actually put a video recently up on our school counseling FAQ. On, it's a video FAQ that you can access on our school's YouTube page. If you just Google, or I'm sorry, hop on YouTube and look up North Tower High School, there's a, a playlist about FAQs. One of the most recent ones that I put up was one on how, to, how does GPA work? And so you might want to hop on there and just get an idea that I'm not going to cover that here today, but about four minutes, five minutes, I cover how GPA works in a pretty digestible way. Okay. Um, the other piece is knowing that a lot of these classes do build on each other. So if you fail a class, a lot of times that can cause a trickle down effect where you're missing key like content. Where if you f fail integrated math one, being successful in integrated math two, for example, could be rather challenging, all right? Another thing that, that we see working with students is that involvement indicates success. So involvement is directly correlated to students feeling at home on campus, to being connected with peers, and actually just being successful academically as well. Okay, so getting involved, joining a club, um, volunteering, playing a sport, okay, those things are going to be super valuable for students. Um, but like I said, going back to those underlying bold things, you want to balance yourself. Don't spread yourself too thin. Okay, they want to see depth. When, when schools are, say, looking at um, what students are doing, they don't necessarily want to see students doing everything. They want to see students doing something that they value. It is time to start researching colleges and careers. Um, students will be getting some information about that in a couple of weeks um, in one of my morning uh, morning minute sessions uh, with some tools that they can use. But starting to research colleges and careers, and actually in 10th grade, careers is the main focus. A lot of people want to jump straight to this idea of college, but you you don't end, you don't work in, you don't go to do, to a career and then work in college for the rest of your life. You start in college with the idea of finding a career that you'll then work in for a period or a long period of time. And so actually that's typically where you want to start. You want to identify what are some of the interests, what are the career fields, not necessarily a specific job, but potentially a career field or area that I might be interested in. So I can do some more research and finding out what that looks like, all right? 
traveling and going on college fairs, that kind of stuff is pretty tough these days. Um, it may be tough for a period of time. If you are safely able to travel and visit a college, it's a great experience. Um, but just don't put yourself out there and be unsafe to do it. Um, it is not worth it for you and other people. Okay. But it is something that as things change over the period of time in this coming years, um, it would be a valuable opportunity if, if it presents itself to go do a college fair. Um, we do have virtual college visits that are happening this fall um, that students can log into their Naviance account and see what schools are potentially going to be coming. Uh, and so they can ask and request to join those sessions and they're um, generally about a half hour long or so. Um, and then also just starting to write things down. I'm going to take just a minute and talk a little bit about, to the best of my ability, uh, an ever-changing, very sticky subject of testing. All right. Like it says, there's a lot of unknowns that are happening in the world of testing right now um, in a lot of different areas. So from anything from the PSAT to the SAT, ACT to AP exams, there's a lot of unknowns in this current fall time frame. Um, the good news of it is most 10th graders are not really going to need to worry much about it at this point in this school year. However, it will probably have, like I said, reverberations that will continue for years down the road. And some of those things will probably be benefits for your student. Um, there's some pretty strong traction that's being gained about going test optional or test blind. A lot of value or weight in the world of college admissions is oftentimes placed on a college admissions test like an SAT or an ACT. And there's, there's some good, decent reasons why, and I can understand why that is. It's one of the only things that can be kind of nationally normed, meaning a student who takes an SAT exam can be statistically compared to, a, in Florida, can be statistically compared to a student in California, um, where things like curriculums, requirements, grading, transcripts, all that other stuff, um, GPA, those things are pretty subjective to the individual institution and local community. Um, those are harder to compare, all right? So they're being more compared on the local context. So like how, how are they comparing to other students in the school versus like a national comparison? And so there is some, some you know, I would say justifiable value. The, the issue is going to be is it's, if it's providing an equitable approach and if it really does present the information that they are looking for in a, in a kind of valid way. And so there's a lot of movement that's heading in the direction where a lot of schools are probably going to be test optional for a period of time, if not forever. And so I would say that's generally a good thing for students. And so as we go into... 10th grade, 11th and 12th grade year, we're going to have to kind of keep an eye on kind of the, the, the temperature of testing as we approach, you know, falls, fall of senior year. And so just know that we will have some issues that will arise. So one of the things that's going to be a little different than in years past, um, in the years past, we were able to offer the PSAT or preliminary SAT, I call the practice SAT. Um, exam for both 10th graders and 11th graders. Um, and so this year is going to be pretty different uh, for a lot of different reasons. And so we are not, normally the PSAT is given in October every year. We will not be giving it in October to anybody. Um, we are potentially looking at a way to offer it to a small group of juniors only because uh, they did not, this would be the, the, 11th grade is actually the year when, when it's probably most valuable for students. Um, and so we are looking at a way to offer it for interested 11th graders only, potentially in the early springtime. So unfortunately for the 10th graders, uh, we will not be offering a 10th grade as PSAT um, this year, but we will plan on offering it if everything is safe and able to do so in the fall of 2021 for your class. And so you'd be taking that for the first time as a junior. So there are some downsides there, but in general, I think you'll be fine. Um, I'm not hyper worried about it. Um, but unfortunately, that's kind of the climate that we are trying to navigate uh, with that. And so just to give you a brief overview about what some of the different tests look like and how to prepare for them. This is uh, mainly for information's sake, but the SAT and, and there's a sister test ACT, but that's definitely not as common for our students to take. The SAT is more prevalent. Um, it just breaks it down in kind of a little bit different uh, section. So there's two sections of three different tests. And so the reading, writing, and language, and then math. And there is an optional SAT essay component. Um, I would say we used to suggest the SAT essay being done for every student because uh, the UC system required it. The CSU system doesn't. Going forward, at least as of this recording, 
Um, neither the CSU or the UCs require the essay, and only a very small component of schools do require the essay. And so you might want to do some research in advance if you um, are going to take the SAT to determine if uh, schools will be requiring it. Most students will not be taking the SAT until typically the spring of their junior year anyway. So you're not going to have to worry about this for a little bit. <clears throat> and the hope is that we have a better idea of what um, a little bit more regularity. Um, the SAT and ACT are kind of a mess right now. So be glad that you're not in that uh, kind of sphere having to, to battle for this and determine if it's a good idea. Uh, it's something that you guys will get there and there might be some changes that will happen because of that, but ultimately it's a, a little bit further down the road. So hopefully some things kind of regulate a little bit more um, consistently over the next couple of months. But ultimately this kind of breaks down what it looks like. Uh, it's about three hours without the essay and about four hours with, with it. And there are no penalties for wrong answers. Uh, we also provide, uh, students can use up to two fee waivers for the SAT if they qualify. Essentially, if, they, if you qualify for free and reduced lunch at school, you'll likely qualify for an SAT fee waiver. So if you find, find that that might be beneficial, please reach out to me uh, when you get to the time frame when you're ready to sign up for the SAT. Please don't reach out now um, unless you're really going to be signing up for it, which I would not recommend uh, for a lot of reasons currently. There are some some suggested prep work that you can do. And really, the good news is, is it's just coming to school and learning for learning. All right. So the best way to actually prepare for the SAT uh, at this point is really just engaging in your classes and doing the work to learn and retain the knowledge, not just check off a box. All right. So, so really kind of pursuing your education to the full, fullest ability. The, the test prep that could become more relevant as you enter junior year, for example, um, is available. There's several different options that we, we promote. One of them is uh, if you're doing the ACT, we do provide free ACT prep through Naviance Test Prep that students will log into their Naviance account and have access to. Um, and then College Board has the SAT rough equivalent of that. And they're both online tools. Both are free uh, for our students. And so um, it would be something that as students get a little closer to when they're going to take it, I would suggest doing. And really the point of that is so they understand how the test works. Okay, it's not necessarily going to give you a lot of the content knowledge, which is kind of what you're learning now and, and really need to focus on now is the content. They're going to teach you how to take the test and how to be a smart test taker, meaning like, okay, there are time sections. How do we make sure that we're not spending five minutes on one question and leaving 10 seconds for the next four? Okay, so that's the benefit of test prep. Advanced placement is something that your student might also be getting into now. And so that's gonna be, uh, it's called AP or advanced placement. That is a college board program as well, just like the PSAT and the SAT program is. Um, they're uh, copywritten programming. And so every school that offers an AP program has to go through and like, again, kind of like the A through G requirements, submit their syllabi and have it approved by the system. And so every program offers roughly the same content. So they provide a little bit lev more level of that continuity across the country. So while each teacher can provide their own flavor to the course, the core content of the course will be essentially the same in any AP class that you take, if you took it here or somewhere else. Um, the reason why it's a big deal now is because like I said earlier, the, the, the balancing piece, that 10th grade bump, um, a lot of times students might be taking one or two AP classes um, this year. And, and most students that are maintaining this A through G track will probably have about five core classes this year because we start history. And so this AP course uh, is an accelerated program and it requires a lot more work, a lot more reading, a lot more dedication. Okay, and students can take this course and that provides, if you watch that GPA video, it actually AP courses do provide an a, a, a weighted GPA point for the class. And so it's something that you can you can learn what that means. And, and it is kind of recognition of, of taking on a more accelerated and advanced program. Um, the optional component of the test, uh, if a student feels pretty, you know, moderately prepared, we encourage students to take the AP exam, which happens in May. This is not a pre-test. This is a test at the end of the course. So a capstone exam. And it is a cumulative hard exam. And so it's something that students can take. There's a cost involved, which we'll be sending out more information about that um, in, the, in the next couple of weeks. But um, they will decide if they are going to take that before, you know, the, the new year turns around. But ultimately, that exam happens in the first two weeks of May generally. And we're still waiting on information. It was all, di all electronic this last year. We're going to have to figure out how that's going to work. We won't probably know for a while uh, how the exams are going to work in May. But um, by passing the exams, they're graded out of five. By passing the exams, you can actually earn college level credit at many institutions. 
So if you generally earn a three, four, or five on the exam, you can actually earn some college level credits for those courses. So it's generally a pretty wise investment if a student feels even moderately competent in the course because there's a you know a chance that they might be able to pass that exam. So it's definitely um, valuable. The registration will be done online, so the students will be invited to their AP classrooms, kind of like a Google Classroom. The student, the parent, or I'm sorry, the teacher will provide. Uh, a join code that they will then have to join uh, an AP classroom. Okay, that's going to be important because they will have to indicate the student. No one else does. The student will have to indicate that they're going to be taking the exam in May. The registration deadline. So basically, basically the deadline to indicate that on their AP classroom is November 6th at noon for all exams. And there will be no changes accepted after that date and time. All right, we'll be placing orders that afternoon. And so you do have to indicate that. And that is for an exam that happens in May. We will be likely going to be doing AP exam payments, which we are going to, again, finalize uh, the, the cost of these exams. Full price is about $94. Um, in the past, TTUSD has been able to subsidize that. We're still finalizing that detail. So we'll update um, with some information about that in the next couple of weeks. But we'll be li likely doing it through the Titan program on the Aries portal, um, so a digital payment process, uh, kind of like you do for Chromebook insurance, stuff like that. And that payment will actually be due before we leave for that holiday break in December, so December 18th. So we're going to try to bump up the timeline a little bit. The early registration is not our decision. That's College Board's decision. The payment uh, is hoping to be done before that holiday season starts, um, and we can kind of wrap up those deposits instead of having them carry over throughout the rest of the year. Just kind of wrapping up, uh, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, but basically, you know, a big thing about sophomore year, again, is like that, that getting better at school and, and continuing to work on our academic process. And one of the biggest academic processes that you might see change is, again, the higher expectation of homework. And so students will be differentiating more in terms of what they're taking on, like I said, AP classes or not. And, and so these classes that students will be taking um, will come with additional workload. And while we're on distance learning and hybrid, like things are, are definitely being pared back, there will still be more homework than there was in the spring. The expectations will be higher than they were in the spring time frame. And so just being prepared and having a system in place. Most students can expect at least one to two hours of homework every night. All right. Um, a lot of teachers have pared back and said like most of, you know, my homework is anything that you don't get done during kind of the class time. And that's something we've noticed, especially on distance learning, that students sometimes don't utilize class time very well. And they don't do that all the time in regular school either. But um, we see it a little bit more uh, kind of highlighted in distance learning. So helping that, helping your student maybe set up a time when they do their work and, and encouraging a, a, as quiet, a, quiet and kind of peaceful place as you can, not in front of the TV, not in their bed, things like that. Um, spending that one to two hours outside of kind of their general school day is, is a pretty rough, essentially target that students can look at, look at to kind of make sure that they're completing everything that they need to, to be ready for, you know, the, whether it's a quiz or a project and they can even just read or maybe do a little college research or something like that. So community service, uh, is kind of in flux as well with a lot of the changes that have happened. Um, they still have hours that are going to be required. So the class of 2023, as of today, will be required to have reported the three hours from the fall of 2019 when school is essentially normal. Um, the spring hours were waived for all students. So, so that would be the second half of the three to make six total for ninth grade. Um, the hours from this year, the zero that you see here is waived. So we are not gonna be collecting or requiring uh, community service hours from this year. If you would like to collect community service hours, follow the same process and they can still be applied to the total amount However, in the future, again, and this is kind of assuming that things get roughly back to normal um, in future years, students will be required to do eight hours in their junior year and eight hours in their senior year. And those hours will be required if you're gonna pass pathways. So while you can use these hours to complete your total 19 hours that you'll need to show for graduation, um, you might be collecting more in the future, which will then, you know, you'll have more hours than you technically need, but that um, there are those two different requirements. Okay, so just make sure that if you are going to do that, make sure you're following some of the requirements that we have. Um, you know, I'm not going to really break down the transcript all that much for you at this meeting, I don't think. Um, this is a transcript. This is uh, what it would look like. This is roughly the start of a senior year transcript. <coughs> so 
On the GPA video, I kind of break down what the GPA looks like. So you can watch that video for that information. Essentially, if you're looking at a transcript, this will be what it kind of looks like when we send stuff to colleges. Uh, but you can roughly see what is on there. There's the name of the class, the grade, and your credits. And this is really gonna, you know, your credit summary is down here. A lot of this stuff is also available on Aries, which I also put up on a Parent Academy video about what, uh, how to access the your parent, uh, parent portal on Aries and covered a few areas like this. So you can see where your credit summaries are and see your transcripts. So um, we'll break this down a little bit in the future at another time. I think that's gonna be a better use of our time. So just in general, if you wanna look at them, if you have any questions about a transcript, like my grade doesn't look right, that's a big deal, please ask. The last main thing that I wanna just remind students about is that you do have a, a pretty powerful tool uh, that you generally start utilizing more frequently as we get older. Um, the downside of this year is we're not likely gonna have much of our pathways curriculum, which will have students log into this tool pretty frequently. So it's something that you might wanna do as a student. And so it's called Naviance and it's called Naviance Student. And the information that you can log in and have access to is pretty broad and, and powerful. So a lot of it is about college and career prep. And so you can actually do a lot of research about colleges, about careers. And like I said, in the video that I'll send out in a couple of weeks, probably at the beginning of October uh, for students in our morning minutes, I'll talk about career, basically career research and major research. And that's something that you can spend some time on Naviance doing and, and have a really great opportunity to get information. So I wanna encourage you to log in and check it out. You will be asked to use it more frequently in the future. Um, but it is definitely starting to become more valuable to you as a sophomore. So log in, make sure you know your login. Um, you log in using your Clever account uh, students and it's just a great tool. So I know that was about, it's, an hour, it's about an hour long <laughs> total. And I wanna thank you for hanging in there. It's a lot of information. Um, it's a broad overview, but I think it's a good start for us to kind of jump into our 10th grade year. This is a year for the record books, for sure. Um, everyone is kind of a new teacher this year, new counselor. Everyone's kind of figuring out some of the different processes and making some changes. So thank you for, for hanging in there with us, letting us try to do our very best to support students, keep kids safe. Um, we are trying to be as flexible as we can. And you know we appreciate the grace and patience that you guys show us too as parents. Um, it can't be easy, I know. And we're all trying to do the best we can with what we got. So I appreciate you guys watching this video uh, in the future. Hopefully we'll have a live session as well. Uh, this year, it's just most things are gonna be in this format. And so um, if anything comes up, feel free to email me, make an appointment online. Uh, my contact information is all on the website and you can feel free to reach out with any, any need that you might have. But thank you for watching and I look forward to working with you guys over the next couple of years.